everyone, I'm Bo. And I'm Jamie. And this is the only podcast on this feed that I'm aware of that dares to ask the cinematic question, Hey Jamie, what you watching? I'm watching a lot. Yeah, uh, it's, it, it is the season, right? It is. And um, just out of the gate, I want to apologize for my voice. I have uh, went to an amusement park for my birthday on Friday and screamed my head off. And so I have, my, my voice is, is paying for it. And this is two days later and I still sound like Phoebe when she's trying to get her sexy singing voice on. Would you say you are and, screaming like Benchy? I was scream like Benchy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know what? That's a movie that people don't talk about nearly enough. I, I feel like, I mean, I, I don't think you're wrong about that. As far as I'm concerned, it should be talked about on the daily, but I do feel like more people have come around to it in the past like decade or so. I feel like I've, I've seen and heard it talked about more. Well, good. Cause it deserves it. Yeah. And it, maybe it's the Tom Atkins kind of reaching that near legendary status that you know he's almost like a folk hero at this point um but yeah i feel like maybe it's just because i'm always telling people to watch night of the creeps maybe it's just me it's the bias of just me saying like hey you should watch night of the creeps to everyone i run across yeah well, it's an excellent film it's but really good i didn't watch it recently uh, but what i did watch was i did my annual birthday watch which uh -huh. is a double feature of Bloody Birthday and Happy Birthday to Me. I watch those on my birthday, every birthday. Now, this year, I had to watch them on Thursday because we were out all day on Friday. But I still squoze them in. <laughs> Squeezed so. or squoozing. Um, yes. I, I don't think I've ever seen Bloody Birthday. Bloody Birthday is... Uh, it's like... It's a slasher from 81, but it um, it's about these three kids excuse me, who were all born on the same, at the same time when there was a total eclipse. And because the sun was blocking Saturn or the, the whole eclipse thing was blocking Saturn at the moment they were born, there's something missing from their personalities. And it <laughs> turns out it's, uh, a soul. it's their, their, con yeah, their conscience is, is missing. So there are three little, just evil, evil kids. And uh, you get an extended nude dancing scene from Julie Brown <laughs> that is uh, kind of legendary, hmm. but uh, it's it's a fun one. I, it's not it's not one of those like tentpole slasher movies. It's not one that I would say if you have an essentials list that it would have to be on there. But it's one that I just particularly enjoy, and also it's birthday themed, so that's why. Yeah, I get it. And I I have a soft spot for Happy Birthday to Me, which we did a deep dive on Dark Parade a while back on that one with Court. And, um, you know, we the, the thing we came around to in that discussion was that um, it was more giallo mm -hmm. than slasher, really. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree with that. I... Um when we were watching it this time and that's a movie I've seen into the dozens because I watch it every year. Um, but for this time we actually just put everything down and we were really paying attention to every little detail when we watched it this time. Not, I mean, not on purpose. We didn't plan it. We just did. And it has a lot of problems in that the pacing is really bizarre. There are things you could, wholesale cut scenes from the film and it wouldn't change the outcome mm -hmm. at all with this whole secondary brain storyline. But I mean, where that, <laughs> um, that whole thing came, I mean, originally she was supposed to be the killer. So they were like building up this whole story for her to be the killer. And then at the end, when they changed everything, it just, it doesn't make sense anymore, yeah. <laughs> but, and, it, and it's not necessary at all anymore, but I still I have yeah it's one that I grew up on and that I love and I watch it every year because I love it but I fully admit it has a lot of issues in that I mean it's really long and if you cut out all the stuff that isn't necessary 
then it would be a much tighter, leaner film. Mm -hmm. But I still get a kick out of it, you know, and then Glenn Ford with his drunk ass. And, and from what I understand during the production of that, he was drinking a lot and very belligerent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah. You know. It's, yeah, I I have a real kind of love hate relationship with it. Cause I agree. I think it's, it's about 30 minutes too long. Um, and yeah, it's an it, interesting story, but you know, if you're, curious about more not only uh based on what jamie said but if you want to hear you know a, a, me and court talk about that movie with a lot of director's commentary rattling around in our heads uh feel free to to jump on that listeners but i it's... actually will i didn't hear that and that is something i would love to hear you guys talk about so i'm gonna go back and find that and listen to it i think court's analogy was that is that movie takes off aimed for slasherville and takes an emergency landing into giallo town and it's well, like and yeah. even down to the the black gloves uh -huh. um and I, I, one thing I love about that film is how they go out of their way to try and paint every single character as a red herring. At some point, every character is looked at suspiciously for something they say or just some kind of crazy look that they give or just like Etienne with him breaking into her room and stealing mm -hmm. her panties and all these things. Like everyone is given uh, and Alfred, that poor kid. Like, I don't even know why he hangs out with those kids. It just doesn't, it, it's like he doesn't even fit. But, and he's just treated as creepy throughout the entire thing. So much so that I named him Creepy McDidn't Do It while we were watching <laughs> this movie. And I was just like, oh, look, here he is again. Creepy McDidn't Do It, you know? And it's like, because they try really hard to make you think it's this person or it's this person or it's this person. And, and when... There is no way in hell anyone could ever guess that ending if you've never seen the movie before. You're not going to come up with that. Uh, that whole Scooby-Doo, uh, you know, it was Mr. Carster's the whole time. I don't know where I got that last name. I just made that up. But <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like it, though. Uh, but then you end it with that amazing ending song, which I love. And I just, it's on my horror playlist and i play it all the time it's right up there with the ballad of harry warden mm -hmm. um i just i love that so much so there's just it, it has a lot of issues and i honestly think that i told brian while we were watching it i'm like i want to do a fan edit of this film and just excise all the stuff that you don't have to have and just see what see how clean i can make it how much tighter i can make it just because because i love the film as it is for nostalgic reasons but i fully admit it needs an editor like it needs another mm -hmm. pass or two you know but uh you know it's a it's it's an interesting one and a lot of people don't like it for those reasons but i just think it's part of its charm yeah, I, yeah, I, it, it's one of those things. Like it, this is flawed, but I still really like it. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and and I, I always am uh, a, a bit fonder of it. I think because the Melissa Sue Anderson is in it, mm -hmm. and I'm like, you know, I the all, all I know from her is Little House on the Prairie, really. So it's just fascinating to see you know yeah. her t taking on a role that is so wildly different which is you know all actors do that right of like hey i am known as this poly pure heart on this show about you know the prairie where i play the the sweet little blind girl and so now i'm gonna you know be in this uh this kind of murder mystery horror film and well, it's like uh, when Lisa Bonet made. Um, uh, oh, Angel Heart, right? Angel yeah. Heart, thank you. I wanted to say Heart of Darkness, and I don't know why, but yeah, uh, we, you know, it's they when you grow up in the spotlight as this like good kid, they they always want to break out, and I can't blame them for it. Like, I, like, look, I don't want to be trapped in this same role for the rest of my life. Now, Melissa Sue Anderson, at, around this time, she was doing a lot of 
of these kind of movies. She did a, you know, a movie, uh, Midnight Offerings, where there was a whole witch-themed movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, then she did a movie where she was playing a girl who was a um, like a kleptomaniac. So she was trying really hard to break out of that Mary Ingalls role. But at, when we were watching this the other night, I was just like, I wonder when this movie came out, how many boys who had a crush on Mary Ingalls were just losing their shit when she got to the scene where she was taking her clothes off and, you know, you see her in her bra and stuff. And I was just like, I wonder how many kids were or like how many guys who were just like, oh, my God, you know, um, I at honestly, least one. Yeah, <laughs> I can I can verify. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> that blind eagles girl is getting naked and you know it's funny and this is totally random and it has nothing to do with anything except for little house on the prairie when we were at cedar point on friday there was this little boy and he came running up and like cut in line between brian and me and then the other people we were with uh we were getting going to get on one of the coasters and he just came running up and just cut in between us and I thought <laughs> at first, before he turned around, and then when he turned around, it actually didn't help, but I could see that it was a boy, but he looked just like Nellie from Little House on the Prairie. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, holy shit, I just got cut off by Nellie. <laughs> like nobody would get that. Like, <laughs> Oh, that's a bummer. I mean, people our age would get it. Sure, but... sure. Like nobody else is going to get that joke. You know, yeah, th this is a thing I'm forever... Like, you know, when, I, when I'm talking to the kids, I don't, I, I don't filter for age. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times I'm just like, do you have any idea what I'm talking about? And they're like, no, I have no idea what reference it is that you're making. Like, I don't know what a mash is. And I'm like, well, it's a very popular <laughs> television show 50 years ago. And they're like, okay, fine, old man. Who gives a shit? <laughs> a mash. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what a mash is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What, who is, who is Cotter and why are they welcoming him back? You know, what's funny is that there are things that I thought just as I was growing up would always be in the zeitgeist. They're just, you know, they're references that people would always get. And there was something I thought of the other day. No, I can't remember what it was, but I was just like, damn, nobody ever talks about that anymore. Like nobody ever makes those jokes anymore. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever. And Brian's like, nobody knows what the fuck that is anymore. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. And it was a TV show, but. I'm like, yeah, but it used to be like all of these shows used to be in the, the common, mm -hmm. like everyone knew them. And now uh, you're, I mean, it, it's kind of hit or miss if you make a reference, if anybody's going to get it. And that even is true at work, you know, cause I work with people who were younger than me and a lot of times they have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, do you know how much I would love to make more manimal jokes? I would love that, but I can't. Who wouldn't? Right. Nobody knows what a manimal is at this point, and it, it breaks my heart. Yeah, I actually had manimal as my, uh, years and years ago, I had manimal as my profile picture on Facebook. And it amazed me just how many people, like, they would comment, you know, a lot of people did know what it was and a lot of people had no idea, even people our age, because it was a very short lived show, but there are even people our age who didn't get the reference. And I was mm. just like, oh, man, that makes me sad. Because <laughs> um, when it was on, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I wish that there were a way to just insert, like, in inject knowledge into someone's head so that you could be like, no, 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 this is a really funny joke. And yeah. I need you to have this Matrix-like dump of information so that you'll understand how funny it was. Yeah, I mean, because, for instance, now, um, going back to Happy Birthday to Me, people who come into that show now have no idea the significance of Melissa Sue Anderson playing that part at that time. Because when that movie came out, Little House was still on. It was still on the mm -hmm. air. And that was a big deal. And uh, it, was a, it was a huge departure from what most people knew her as. And uh, no one would get that now. And you can't, I mean, I don't blame them for it. It's just kind of sad that it doesn't hit the same way. Yeah. Uh, hey, I, I've got a movie I can talk about. Okay, go for it. So, um, <laughs> so recently, speaking of 
screwing around with the kids. Um, I found myself in a situation where the kids were like, Hey, we want to watch a scary movie, but nothing too scary. And I was like, uh, huh, uh, huh. um, well, cause we had just watched Hocus Pocus and okay. you know, cause their mom's really into that movie and the sequels coming out. And it's like, look, what, whether we like it or not, we were watching Hocus Pocus do in this house. And you might as well get cool with it, that idea. And also let's watch the original Hocus Pocus. So you have an idea of what, what the hell Hocus Pocus two is. Uh, what is a Hocus Pocus? And, uh, and I, you know, I still find Hocus Pocus to be mostly average. It's cute. I guess. I never liked it. It's. So don't feel bad. Yeah. It's kind of fine. You know, Maya really loves it and I'm not, I'm not going to rain on that parade. You know, I would be a fool to have a discussion with her. That's like, let me tell you all the reasons Hocus Pocus isn't all that good. Um, <laughs> that would not get me anywhere. And so <laughs> after watching Hocus Pocus and it was just me and the kids, like she was, uh, out of town at a conference. And, uh, so they were like, well, let's watch something scary. That's maybe a little scarier than Hocus Pocus, but not really scary. And so I whipped out the Monster Squad, which oh. they had never seen. Yay! And I am Today. not a giant fan of the Monster Squad, really. But I was like, oh, this is perfect because they are exactly the right age. That if you are going to watch the Monster Squad and enjoy it, now is the time. Mm -hmm. No, that's perfect. I was 12 when it came out. So I couldn't really help it. Like I couldn't have watched it any earlier because it didn't exist. But I actually was glad that it came. Looking back, I'm glad that it came out when it did. I think it hit at just the right time for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I, I think maybe I was a little too old or I had just seen just harder core stuff. And so by the time I saw Monster Squad, I was like, oh, well, this is nothing. You know, <laughs> like I have I, I have my, my taste in horror films has. Uh, surpassed what this movie is offering. Oh yeah, but at the time, uh, I had a big crush on Andre Gower, so that was a huge part of it. What else and was also, he in? Uh, he was in that. There was a TV show about the president. I don't think I don't remember what it was called, but he was in that for a while. And then I had just seen him a couple, like I think on TV shows or whatever. But I was so in love with him from the Monster Squad. But I also was a big fan at the time of the Universal films. I mean, I still am. Mm -hmm. But I had already been. And I mean, as far as like what you know me, you know my history. Mm -hmm. I was watching everything in the theater from a very tiny age. So it didn't scare me at all. I just loved all the references. I loved the, uh, and I loved it. I just, I remember now still laughing hysterically when Dracula called the little girl a bitch. I was just like, ah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I just thought that was hilarious. But um, yeah, it, it was just, it was fun because it was an updated version of the Universal Monsters, even though they technically weren't the Universal Monsters, but you knew what they were doing. I, and then it, it falls in line with things like Stand By Me or The Goonies mm -hmm. or any any of those like adventure movies where you have kids as the protagonist. So I think it's like a perfect blend of that kind of movie and horror. And if you are a kid who is not into horror, then I think it's a great gateway, which probably the boy child that would be, I mean, because I think the, I think the girl child would be more, just from what you've told me about her, she would be more receptive to even darker things. But yeah. that I was, I'm, I'm thinking that that's probably right in line with what he could handle. Or yeah, would want. I, I, I think that's right. And so the things that got them into it, and, and in fairness, it was, it was the boy's idea. Like he was the one asking for something kind of scary. Aww, so I, I haven't, for him. right. I haven't given up hope. You know, the girl 100% is, like, when we went to the bookstore, it was all like, look, I, I, all I want to read is manga and scary stuff. And I was like, oh, you were such a nerd. I love this. Um, <laughs> uh, but the boy it was, it was the one who asked for something scary. So um, 
And he was a little resistant when I first showed him the trailer. He was like, eh, it looks okay. I don't know. I was like, well, let's look, give it a shot and, and see what you, what you think. And uh, so it, it didn't take him long to get into it. He, he was enjoying it. And then she joined in. And so the things that I learned about the Monster Squad, as far as what children respond to, is Scary German Guy is a winner. Yeah. Especially the that moment where they, you know, he kind of creeps up on them when they're going to get him to translate the the journal, mm -hmm. and he says, you know, he, he creeps up behind him, and then there's that hard cut with him with the knife, and when he says, "And now the time has come to decide if you want the last piece of pie," you know, that thing, and they were just like, "Oh, this is great! Scary German guy's the best." I'm like, "All right, all right, uh, well done, Monster Squad. I see what you're doing here." And so they really liked that. The other thing that was really striking, and I think it's just because modern movies tend not to do this, but when Frankenstein gets sucked up at the end of that movie, they oh. were both like, what the fuck is this? Oh my God, it still <laughs> makes me cry. Yeah, they were like, what do you mean Frankenstein's go going away? It's like, yeah, he's, you know, he's got to go with the other monsters. Friend. Yeah. And Aww. they were, they were just like, that's, that shouldn't happen. He's Aww. supposed to stay. And I'm like, I couldn't, I'm afraid. And yeah, it, 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 that blew me away because I was like, oh, right. Because most movies these days, you don't have like a major likable character die or disappear or go away or whatever the way that. Frankenstein does in the, in the monster squad. And he's such a lovable character again, shout out to Tom Noonan who can do no wrong. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was like, Oh, right, right. I mean, the eighties were a different time where, you know, movies were allowed to be kind of mean. Well, they prepared you for stuff, Yeah. you know? I mean, it, it, it I feel like as kids through movies that were aimed at us, we were faced with loss and sadness and it sucks at the time. But then I, I think when you're older and you look back on that, you end up being grateful for that. Like old yeller mm -hmm. wrecked me when I was a kid, but because of that movie, when I did lose a pet, I was able to understand that sometimes that, that is the best thing for them that you know so yeah i mean i think it's important that we get traumatized a little bit <laughs> just so we can learn from it yeah yeah i agree and you know they were it, it really affected them uh they, they were really yeah. upset by it but but they also really liked the movie when i asked them afterwards and i said you know did, did you actually enjoy the movie i know that frankenstein leaving was sad but uh they were like oh yeah yeah that was good uh, so, um, I think next up is gonna be either Monster House or Paranorman. Oh, those are both good yeah. choices. Well, and, and credit where it's due, those came from Duncan, who was like, oh, let me, I've been down this road with, you know, oh, with yeah, his with kids. Winter, yeah. And so he was like, yeah, by all means, like, <laughs> introduce these movies and these are more of those gateway movies of of getting them into kind of scary stuff although all of this is headed towards at some point over the halloween season we're gonna watch poltergeist yeah i'm waiting for that i'm dying to hear uh how how much because i just think she'll love it you know i, I loved yeah. that when i was a kid i mean i was what eight i, I think when that came out and i loved it i think the clown shit's gonna gonna get them well yeah i mean that was that was a scary part uh -huh. when i was a kid that freaked me out I, uh, yeah, and I, I told <laughs> Maya's only rule with it. She's like, you can show them Poltergeist, but you have to do it at a time when you're going to be over here because oh, when, she's not cleaning up after your mess. Right. Like if they wake <laughs> up in the middle of the night, terrified, you're dealing with it. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm down for this. Like if that's, that's fair. <laughs> right. A hundred percent. I'm not trying to shirk my responsibility here, but if I can get them into Poltergeist, then that that means like oh we can do some other stuff that's a little like hardcore not hardcore hardcore like i'm not gonna just turn around and be like and this Here's is murders the, right <laughs> this is called the exorcist um i think you're gonna enjoy it um you know but something like uh you know maybe like a wreck or something like that 
Whoa, damn. You know, I don't know. Well, I'll, that I'll, movie gets me now. <laughs> right, right. You know, I'll, we'll have to play it a little bit by ear. Or, you know, maybe like Lost Boys or something like that. Maybe they'll they'll get into something like that. And, um, you know, I don't know. It's like the big thing is uh, the 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 rule is like no no in intense like nudity or or sexy times is is kind of what we're avoiding for right now. And so that's the the limit is I've got to. By the way, if you're listening to this, if you have good suggestions for movies to watch with, uh, scary movies to watch with, like a 10 and 11 year old, uh, then let me know. We're we're keeping it pretty PG, is the idea until that they display an ability to both deal with PG horror movies and I think to also clean the litter box. I think that's also part of it. Um, <laughs> but you know, we're not holding out hope on that one. Um, because the little girl is like, we need a, we need a dog. And it's like, I've got a dog. His name Johnson. No, we need a better dog. One that's not old. Aww. I know. Poor Johnson. <laughs> uh, but in fairness, she's not wrong. Like all he wants to do is nap and eat treats. I get it. So <laughs> she's like, a dog after my own heart. <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's the dog that I want, but they want a dog that, you know, they can kind of scrap with and, and play with and that kind of thing. Johnson's just not interested in that shit. He's too old for it. And so at this point, it's like, all right, well, we'll talk about a dog when you're cleaning the, the litter box on the regular because you were talking about a dog that we're going to end up having to take care of. And I'm, right. I, I got one already. So uh, anyway, but that's enough about Monster Squad. But yeah, it was, it was, it was a real winner. I was like, I had more fun watching the monster squad with them than I've ever had watching the monster squad. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. And I expect regular updates on their, uh, you know, on their horror film education. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very excited. So, uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes, but, uh, what, what else you got? Well, here's an interesting one. It's an older film, but. And it was in our collection. So we were going through the collection. We finally made it to the D's. Mm -hmm. And we're going through the D movies. And we came across this movie. And Brian's like, he's like, I don't think this was mine. This must have been yours. And I was like, I've never seen that. And, but it might have been a movie that I picked up at a video store closing or something and just never watched. But anyway, it's Dark Age from 1987. And it's a John Jarrett movie. A very young john jarrett um you know well obviously before wolf creek mm -hmm. um, but um it's a crocodile movie oh. like a giant a giant crocodile movie and i loved it how I have was, i never seen this i right that's what i said i'm like how have i never seen how is there a crocodile movie that i've never seen and we own it like what is what is going on but anyway, we watched it, and neither of us had seen it before, and it was really good. And what I really liked about it was that, for one, is a straight up Jaws ripoff. I mean, Great. as much as as much as Grizzly is, this is a they. Ha I mean, there are beats. It, it's beat for beat. It, it, but it takes place in Australia, and it's about a giant saltwater crocodile that is killing people. But it has the same thing. Like it even has the mayor who <laughs> he doesn't, he's just like, get rid of it, get rid of it. But the, an interesting thing that they did add was the indigenous people's view. And they have a great deal of respect for the crocodile. And this particular crocodile was, they believe uh, it's been around forever and he's huge. So he's an ancient. And they believe that he carries the spirits of their deceased loved ones because when someone dies, they take some of their bones and they actually go down and feed it to this crocodile. So he has all the spirit, uh, the spirits of their deceased loved ones going back as far as anyone can remember. And they revere this crocodile, but it just so happens that he got into a place where he shouldn't have and started eating people. <laughs> and so the government wants to kill it. They're like, we got to kill it. We got to eradicate it, get rid of it. And then they start just going on this mad killing crocodile thing. And that part I did not, I was like, you didn't need to show me every single crocodile you killed. You could have just told me. 
but they do they go on this whole like uh oh, we're just gonna wipe them all out kind of thing but the john jarrett character he actually is a conservationist and his whole deal is that he wants to protect the species and so he's on the side of the crocodile and he also happens to be really good friends with the elder of the indigenous peoples so you get their point of view which i really appreciate and that's something that you don't frequently get and then uh, and especially in 1987 and then the I was really pleased with the way it ended. And I'm not going to spoil it here because I really think people should see it. But it, um, I, I can't believe I've never seen it. I, and I fucking owned it. Like, I, I don't understand. I don't understand how I missed this movie. I don't understand how I've never even heard of this movie. But it's so good. And so if you are a fan of big, mo- like, big animal movies or, or mm-hmm. monster animal movies or when animals attack or anything like, or Jaws ripoffs. Um, I definitely recommend seeking this one out because it does all of that. But then you also have this other completely original point of view from these, the, the people native to this land who, who revere and respect this creature and all the links that they go through to try to make sure that it doesn't get killed. I, it, it just, it kind of, it made me, well, it made me cry because everything makes me cry, but I thought the effects were really good. It was brutal when it needed to be brutal. I mean, let me tell you, just because you're a kid, that doesn't mean you're safe. Oh, all right. uh, I like the sound of that. uh, Yeah. I really think you'll dig it. I do. I, 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 if anyone I know would appreciate this movie as much as I do, I think it would be you. So, yeah, I mean, a cursory look, and it's just not available anywhere. And so, yeah, at some point I'll just have to order that up because that sounds too much like something I would love. Um, But, yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, oh, no wonder I haven't seen it. It's just it's not on any of the streamers or anything. So, yeah. uh, And plus, uh, John Jarrett. Now, I know that he was a big actor in Australia. Like, he did a lot in Australia before he became... Um, you know, the Wolf Creek guy, Mm -hmm. and everybody knew him. Um, He had a career for a long time before that. And I think I've seen one other film of his when he was younger. But I really like him. And I wish that he had actually been more mainstream just over here because he was really good. And he's a good looking fella. Like he, I was like, I like this guy, you know, and but I never knew who he was until Wolf Creek. But yeah, it's, uh, it was just, it was 1987 and it was a giant crocodile and it was Australia and it was John Jarrett and all of that to me is good. Mm. So, uh, yeah, Crikey, if, it's a crocodile, right? <laughs> if you can find it, I highly recommend it. Uh, all right. I'll, uh, I'll put out the feelers. I would like to see that. Um, I saw here. This is, I don't know how much we actually want to talk about it, but um, there are some things I don't want to talk about just because, uh, you know, I'm in the middle of that 31 days of Halloween and I don't want to spoil the movies I'm watching for that just yet. Okay. But I took a, a little, a little personal time to watch a couple of movies last night and I watched uh, for the first time in a long time, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The and, original? Yeah. The OG. Okay the the Tobey Hooper classic and man man you will forget how good that movie is like I know it's one of the best movies ever and all that stuff but like just in the throes of watching it yeah yeah I was like man I always like uh, yes it's a stone cold classic a hundred percent but uh like uh uh what's his name uh Jim Seedow the the (laughs) guy you know runs the gas station yeah 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 the moment that he gets home with Marilyn Burns in the bag and he's like, look what your brother did to this, this door. It's why we can't have nice things. It's so damn funny. And, and I think that's what makes chainsaw the movie that it is in a lot of ways 
is that it has this underlying black comedy, which when oh, you yeah. when you get to Chainsaw Two, it, it's that, overt. Right, right. It's all just right there on the surface. It is just nonsense. Um, you know, and we, and it's great, and I I really enjoy it. But you know, the first one is that just that that pitch perfect blend of it being very darkly funny. Like when he's poking her with the stick and stuff in the cab of yeah. the truck, it's very funny. But it'll, but you're also like, this is horrible, but I'm laughing at this. And I I don't know if that makes me a bad person, but here we are. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there's that. And then once you get to the dinner table scene, obviously... When, you know, and, and one of the things that I was doing as I was watching is I was kind of going back and forth between the director's commentary as well as the actual movie. And it's the, the one I was listening to is Hooper, uh, the cinematographer, Daniel Pearl and uh, Gunnar Hansen are the, the three people on the, the, uh, the track. And so I was watching the dinner table saying, I was like, I wonder what they have to say about this. And I, I knew that the conditions of making the movie were bad. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of the apocrypha about the film, but they were talking about how the, the guy that they had in the old man makeup had essentially decided that he was done filming. And so they were going to shoot until his one day of shooting was done. But that one day of shooting ran 27 hours. Mm -hmm. And so they filmed 27 hours straight in this Texas heat. And Gunnar Hansen was talking about how by the end of the, that scene, and that's what they were shooting during that 27 hours. He was like, by the end of that scene, when Jim C. Dow is like, hit her, hit the bitch. Uh, he was like, I was just going to do it. Like I, I had totally forgotten that I was a human being that this was a, a movie that we were filming. He was like, I, we just all had lost our minds by that point. And it sounds like, and, and, but I think that's what makes it genius. Like why that move, why that scene in particular is just so like radical and crazy. And, and it's just mayhem. It's just a fever dream. And Wait. You know, and then she jumps out a window and the movie's over in five minutes. And you're like, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I guess that's all we needed to see. Uh, but, oh, my God. I it's just... amazing how, and that's something you can never recreate because you can't recreate that scenario. You know, you're never going, you're never going to be able to make a movie in that heat with the same conditions with the rotting food, with the, you know, everyone smelling to high heaven with Gunnar Hansen's shirt being so stiff that it, <laughs> right. it, that it broke. Um, like it, it just, it, that is a once in a lifetime thing. And if someone were to try to make a shot for shot remake of that film, you couldn't do it. You, you wouldn't be able to capture it because so much of the environment contributed to what that movie became it was just a it was just like a little a snapshot in time and perfection you know yeah. we just went through the entire franchise because we did a franchise retrospective for patreon so we went through every single texas chainsaw movie right back to back to back to back to back and um Nothing, and as much as there are other ones that I do really like, um, like two, yeah. you know, and and there are, but there are other ones that I really don't like. Actually, the one that I outright can't stand is four. But is that you know new generation? Yeah, yeah. The, um, yeah, that, that it's god awful. That gets into <laughs> some lore that you're like, this is unnecessary, and stop it at once. And, and yeah, it, it's it just get some help. Stop. Yeah. Stop it. Get some help. <laughs> it's terrible. But, you know, he, just watching them all in a row like that, it, the, nothing comes close to the original in, in any way. And I love Chainsaw 2. I love it, but just for very different reasons. But it's just none of the other ones even can cast a shadow 
on the first one. I, I just, in my opinion, it just doesn't, nothing holds up to it. It is just un, untoppable. Yeah. But it, I do maintain that when people say that they, uh, that part two is so very different from the first one and because it's so comedic, I think if you watch them back to back, you'll see, uh, just like you said, there is a, a through line of dark comedy in the first one. And honestly, if you just look at how the, the family, how they interact with each other and among themselves, and then you compare it to how they interact with each other in part two, it's really not that far off. It is definitely more exaggerated and it's brought more to the surface, but their the interworkings of their family are the virtually the same mm -hmm. like the way the way that all these characters treat each other talk to each other interact with each other it's really not that far off so i i yeah i love it that's awesome i i love that movie that is one of my all-time favorite movies yeah. i just think it's perfect it, i i agree it it's really something um you know uh, again, this is not breaking any new ground for someone to be like, hey, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a really good movie, but it really is just, it's such an assault. And, um, you know, like Hooper talking about how, like, this was going to be a PG movie, and that's why there's so little blood in it. Yeah. And he said, you know, I have people all the time, you know, back when he was alive, of course. But uh, he said, I had people coming up to me all the time and saying, that, that movie is so bloody, like, when you... You know, he puts her on the hook and everything. It's like, there's no blood when that happens. There's some blood behind her on the wall, but that's not, like, you don't see it spray or anything. That's just there. And they'll argue, you know, like, no, no, no. I saw it. I saw the movie. And uh, Hooper said, you know, and that's when I have to tell them, like, I respectfully have to disagree. I was there I when we made it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I can tell you that there's about two ounces of blood that you actually see shed on screen. Yeah, the uh, uh, it's always name checked whenever you have like any of those like Barbara Walters specials or anything talking about, you know, the the horror movies that have that will you know turn your children into murderers, um, or anybody who uh, like looks at the video nasties list or whatever. They're always they always name check tech name check Texas Chainsaw, and I think it's just because the title the Texas Chainsaw Massacre makes it sound like it's going to be very gruesome, but it's really not. And it always makes me laugh whenever people do that. Cause I'm like, Oh, I get it. You haven't seen the movie mm -hmm. <laughs> because if you've seen the movie, then you know, it's really not gory. And uh, there's only one chainsaw in the massacre. I mean, like only one person gets massacred with a chainsaw and it's really it's if you hear the title and you and you just know it by reputation you would think there'd be limbs flying everywhere uh you know just blood spraying maybe some guts hanging you know or like maybe something closer to the one that just came out this year mm -hmm. and that's what that title conjures in your head but it's not that at all it's very psychological yeah. And I think that's the best part about it is that, and I know a lot of people I've heard over the years say that they just can't get into it because Sally's screaming and it just annoys them or whatever. But the, the, the thing I've always loved about that is that that is one of the most realistic depictions that I can imagine of someone just losing their shit because they can't deal their brain can't take it. Like you, everything that she has been through and witnessed, she can't, she just, she can't make it work in her brain. The only thing left to do is just scream uh, because it's, uh, she's lost her shit. She's lost her mind. And I think that that's a very realistic depiction of how somebody would be in a situation like that. Yeah. And so, and I think that makes it scarier uh, yeah i mean yeah it's amazing uh, you know, yeah like, what can you say it's the texas chainsaw massacre uh, right but cover to cover it is just you know shockingly good and disarming and feverish and it, it like it's everything of a horror movie ought to be and and at the end of the day you can do you can write a couple of different essays about what it's saying about the state of america at the time and mm -hmm. the the loss of the uh 
you know community and what it uh, the, the nuclear family it, or yeah and uh, automation and, in the industry yeah um, i don't know how much but, any of that was intended but i you know i don't think it matters i think you know whether they meant for it to be a a timely movie or not like i don't think you can separate the art from the time in which it was made and things bleed in whether yeah. you intend for them to or not you know and i think uh to the probably the most famous example of that is night of the living dead mm -hmm. yeah for sure you know, the, uh, now people people are now reading things into that movie that they weren't reading into that movie even 10 20 years ago but you know new generations come along and they see it through their own lens and they see things that um that people just haven't seen before or weren't and you know weren't intended but if you can see it that way that's the beauty of art you know i think you you can get out of a good piece of art whatever you want and um you know if you listen to romero and he always says you know the whole ben thing in particular was and if you go back and read the script he's right he didn't lie you know mm -hmm. there was nothing in there about race at all and I mean, why would he lie about it? Because that would, I mean, that would actually make him look good. You know, if he said, yeah, that would, I did all that on purpose. And, you know, if he just went along with it, then, you know, he's, pro he's a progressive hero, you know, but no, he's just like, I just, I liked him. He was a good actor. And if you go back and read the script, yeah, it, it doesn't say anything about that. And I think if he was intentionally trying to inject anything about racism into the film, then he would have worked it into the script, but not once does any, does it come up in conversation. And especially if you have a character like Harry, and if that was your intent, I think that's going to, I think it would come up, but it didn't because that wasn't the goal. That's not what he was doing. But the beauty of that is that you can look at it now through the lens that we have today and see these things and pull them out. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, whether it was intended or not. It's, you know, if you can pull a message out of something, then I don't think that's a bad thing. But yeah, it's just um, like your point. What was your, oh, <laughs> about you can't separate uh, the film from the time. And because of the time that that film was made, all of those things fit. And I, but I think that's part of the beauty of it. Yeah. And it keeps it fresh, you know, because every time a new generation comes along and discovers something else or finds something else in it that hasn't been seen before or talked about before, that just keeps the film fresh and alive. And that's nothing but a good thing. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's tremendous. It, for for those listening, if you haven't seen Texas Chainsaw in a while, uh, go back and watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Turns out uh, one one of the better horror movies you're likely to ever see in your life. Uh, yeah, it turns out it's pretty good. Yeah, pretty damn good. <laughs> uh, what what other completely obvious movie should we talk about, Jamie? Well, this one I guess is not all that obvious, oh. but uh, it's new. Oh. Um, I went to see Barbarian. Oh, I, okay. So I have heard that this should not be spoiled. It should not. And I won't. Okay. Um, but I've I heard actually, it's good. I went, uh, we did a Patreon review for it with a very um, cursory, this is, you know, I'm not, I, I, I didn't say anything any more than what you would see in the trailer. And then um, we just spoiled the shit out of it after a huge spoiler warning, because mm. yeah, you don't want this movie spoiled. I will say, however, and this is going to confuse some people, I think, but I will say, I recommend watching the trailer. And that is because when I watch the trailer, think of the trailer for hereditary mm -hmm. and how you had an idea about things from the trailer and then when you saw the movie, you were like, what the fuck? You mm -hmm. know, at, the, at the, the head scene, you know. Um, but the trailer led you in a totally different direction. The thing about The Barbarian is, um, yeah, I definitely recommend it. I, yeah, people need to see this movie. But I, I don't, I actually think that it heightened my experience because I had seen the trailer beforehand. Because it made it that much more exciting when everything was revealed and I won't go in any more detail because yeah, you really need, do need to see it. But, uh, 
I will say this, it was really fun. And there were some surprises and I was just, I enjoyed the hell out of it. And I have, to, I really want to thank whoever did make that trailer because I think it was perfect in that it didn't do the don't breathe thing where it gave away the person in the basement in the trailer, which mm -hmm. I just is unforgivable. Um, you know, it didn't do any of that. It set it up just enough to give you an idea of how it starts. And then from there, you might have some ideas going in, you might not, but, and then it just takes off from there. And it was a really fun experience. It was, it was really fun. I had a good time. So I definitely recommend that. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I'll tell you what, I've got one more and then we'll end with one from you. Um, so the one, the other one that I've got is also, uh, a slashery kind of film, which again, not totally like me, but man, you know, what are you going to do every now and again, I'm in the mood for a good one. And when, when I'm looking for a slasher, Jamie, I turn to Tom Savini and, uh, Makes so, sense. so I watched the Prowler last night and good one. I love the Prowler. That is one of my favorites. I, uh, it's, a, it's fucking great. It's so gnarly. That movie is so gnarly that like that movie does not give a fuck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that swimming pool death. It's so good. It's so good. The shower death. The shower death is so where it's good. at. That's the one where you're like, wow, they are going for it in this movie. It's like the yeah. knife through the head outside the shower. Pretty good. You know, like the eyes rolling up white and all that stuff. I'm like, I'm, I'm into this. I'm into this. The moment when you go into the shower and it would be like the, the, the shot that you would see these days is you would see somebody, uh, the prowler, the titular pr prowler plunge the, the, uh, the pitchfork forward into the belly you would see her reaction, a tight shot of her face, the reaction shot of her screaming, cut. And the mm -hmm. Prowler, it is pitchfork going in, tight shot of her face screaming, shot overhead, then a, a different angle shot. Like, it just keeps going on and on as you are seeing this girl get skewered up until she's just dead. And it is gruesome it is violent um you know there's a great head being blown off in that movie as well uh fresh on the heels of maniac uh tom savini was like you know what i think i could blow somebody's head up better and yeah it, it it's incredible what a what a great slasher movie that is the biggest complaint that i have with it is that it'll drag here and there between kills but I really like the look of the Prowler. I think the the killer looks very cool. I don't think it's much of a surprise when you find out like, oh, guess who the Prowler is? You mean the one guy we saw for five minutes and then disappeared to say he's on a wink fishing trip? Um, you know, surprise, surprise, it's that dude. But uh, kind of who cares? You know, it's it's just so vicious and... Uh, it, you know, as far as like early eighties, Hey, we're ripping off the success of black Christmas and Halloween and Friday the 13th and all that stuff. Like there's, there's a bunch of slashers that came in the wake of that. And I think the Prowler is legitimately one of the best also directed by Joseph Zito. Speaking of maniac yeah. who directed that as well as invasion USA and, um, what else? Did, oh, he did Friday four. Friday four. Yeah. yeah. So like, he's a good, not just a good, I think he's a great like grindhouse director. Like he knows what those movies ought to be. And he totally gives the audience what they're there to see. Well, yeah. Even with Friday four, also Tom Savini, mm -hmm. um, the, the kills in that are so much more vicious mm -hmm. than any of the Fridays that came before Jason. And even after Jason is, angry he is pissed off and he is just you can feel the hits every time it, they every kill has weight and it it we just actually we're doing a friday retro right now 
and we just did or recorded the ones for part three and part four. And uh, so we kind of broke it all down while we were talking about it, each individual kill and just how vicious they are. But you pair Zito with Tom Savini and that's what you get. Mm -hmm. It's fucking magic. It's so yeah. good. So good. Um, yeah. Yeah. What a, uh, again, if you're as, as spooky season is upon us, if you want to treat yourself and, uh, and, and have yourself a good time watching a slasher movie, you just can't do better than, uh, the prowler. It's, it's one of my favorites. Like, you know, again, not, not the biggest slasher fan in the world, but the ones I like, I really like. And, I, I could do a Zito back to back of, you know, the Prowler and, and, uh, Friday four any old time. Cause that, that sounds like a great evening to me. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is definitely a top tier slasher and one that I don't think you can call yourself a slasher fan if you haven't seen the Prowler. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, it needs to be, it needs to be there. Right. Yeah, it, it, right. You ought to see that if you like those kinds of movies. Yeah. Okay. Pier yeah. Period. Period. Full stop. Full stop. Uh, Jamie, okay. let's wrap her up with uh, with you. What you got? Okay. Well, do you want really new or really old? Because I can go either way. What is best? Oh. What is best in life? You know what? I'm going to go with something that is really new and actually surprised the hell out of me. Okay. So a couple weeks ago, we had some massive storms mm -hmm. come through here and thousands of people lost power. Oh, is we this a have... miss scenario? What? No. <laughs> and then I went to the grocery store uh, and everything went to hell. A fog no. rolled in. We lost uh, <laughs> a lot of people. It was a real bad scene. No, we just didn't have power for several days. So what do we do when we don't have power? We go to the movies. <laughs> so um, we actually went to the movies two nights in a row. Mm -hmm. And the first night, I was vaguely aware of this film. I had never seen a trailer for it. I didn't really know that much about it, but I knew that it existed. And um, then I was like, well, it's out there. Let's just go see it. Cause it was also $5 movie night and we had no power. So I'm like, let's go see bodies, bodies, bodies. Mm. And I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea, but holy shit. It was so much fun. It was I mean, Pete Davidson is in it, and a lot of people I've heard since then that were like, I don't want to see that because Pete Davidson is in it. He's really great in it, to be honest. But I I really didn't know. I didn't know what to expect, but it's a, a bunch of friends going. They're having a hurricane party, which actually was kind of fitting because we were there because we had no power because of storms. But mm -hmm. they go to um, – they're all rich, and they go to one of their rich friends' houses, Pete Davidson's house, to um, – have a hurricane party and the idea is just they're just gonna wait out the hurricane and do a lot of drinking and drugs but people start dying and <laughs> it is so much fun i just cannot stress how much fun i had and then by the time you get to the end the the end which i won't spoil but by the time you get to the end it's just like oh my god like it just it's it was really fun. I like it's good and bloody and all those parts. I think the characters were interesting, very uh, a lot of different types of characters. Some of them you'll like, some of them you might not, you know, some of them might get on your nerves or whatever. But it's just one of those situations where everyone is trapped in like an old dark house. Mm -hmm. And no matter what they try to do, something fucks it up. And people just keep dying. <laughs> and it's it's funny at times, but it's also uh, like tense at times. And I just, I came out of there and I was like, that was so fun. And I, part of that was probably because I didn't have any preconceived notions. I had no idea what, what to even expect, but I was just like, I'm so glad we saw it. I was so happy. And, um, yeah, I do. I definitely recommend it. I, I don't think it got a lot of, uh, like, I don't think a lot of people went to see it. I'm not sure what it made in the box office, but I don't think it was killing it at the box office or anything. But if you do get a chance to see it, I do recommend it. It was a really fun movie and I had a blast. 
and the audience did too. We were, it wasn't a big audience, but it was, you know, a, a decent size audience and everybody seemed to be getting a kick out of it. So it was a really fun time. Yeah. I, I was having a conversation recently with uh, Duncan and he had seen it and said much the same thing that it was a, a really good time and he had a really, uh, I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I, I gotta see it. Uh, I think it's hitting the streamers in a couple of weeks, so it's probably that's probably when I'm I'm gonna catch up with it. But I'm really looking forward to it. I am not a Pete Davidson fan, uh, but that didn't necessarily keep me from seeing the movie. I just didn't see the movie because every time I've been recently, it's been with the kids, and that did not seem to be a great uh, kids. Yeah, movie. Yeah, that was a good call on that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but it's uh, yeah. I mean, and it's not like a deep movie, you know. It doesn't have a whole lot to say or anything like that. You know, it's not an A24. <laughs> you got to think about it for several days after or mm -hmm. anything like that. It's just fun. And, the, you know, sometimes you just want to have fun. And it was that. I had a great time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, I, I like the fact that A24 is is trying to shake up that view of A24 as being just nothing but high-mindedness and uh and and having a good time you know sometimes that works out sometimes it doesn't uh you know we we're due for another a24 uh Show. recording yeah yeah so you know well we'll hash it all out then i think i uh bodies 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 and the new uh pearl i think are, are the only two that i haven't seen yet i have not yet seen pearl we're planning to go see that um I actually was going to go see it this weekend because it's my birthday and all, but mm -hmm. um, I ended up having to recuperate from Friday all weekend. So I think we're going to go Tuesday. This Tuesday is $5 movie night. So I think we're going to go on Tuesday night and see that. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. I like the X uh, a whole, whole lot. So. Yeah. And then there's Maxine too, which mm -hmm. um, I just love what I love. I mean, I've always been a fan of Ty West and I think that his resurgence, because he went to TV for a long time and he's been doing other shit, but I'm so glad to have him back and doing horror. And uh, I think X was just great. I can't imagine Pearl's going to be any different. I mean, I, I mean, I know it's going to be different, but I mean, I can't imagine it's going to be anything less than great. And I'm excited that there's a third one on the horizon and that Mia Goth was so heavily involved. I mean, uh, as far as Pearl is concerned, she co-wrote that movie with him. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's amazing. And everything I've heard about it was just that she, her acting was just stellar. Like she just killed it. So I'm really excited because I like her a lot too. Also, I like the fact that each film has its own look distinct to the period mm -hmm. of which it's reflecting. I think that's very clever. And, you know, if you go all the way back to House of the Devil, he's good at that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know? Uh so it, it's nice to have him back in the genre. It's nice to have him kind of doing his own thing. And, uh, I'm excited. I, I, I can't wait to see it. I had a great time with X. Uh, that's going to be in the discussion for my favorite thing that I've seen this year. Um, oh yeah. And yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it, again, we live in a, a, the best time in, the, in history, to be a horror movie fan. Not only do we have all the stuff that came before, but every year there are two or three movies that come out that you're like, wow, that is legitimately yeah. a fantastic horror movie. So I always get at least one mm -hmm. that is a game, like a game changer that, and some, some years it comes later in the year, some years it comes earlier in the year. And I'm just, you know, but I know there's going to be at least one, and sometimes I luck out and there's a whole bunch. And honestly, this year, I think there have been several excellent entries. Um, I have not been upset at all with the new movies that we've gotten this year. I haven't seen any bad ones. Now, there are some that I, a lot that I haven't seen. Um, mainly that's because if, if the, the feedback that I've heard about them from people that I trust are just like, meh. And so, um, I'll probably get around to them eventually, but I'm trying to zero in on the ones that are getting the best press, you know, from our peers that yeah. I know, I know how they like, you know, the Duncans and the Dave Z's and the U, I mean, and, and all the other people that I listen to or, 
uh, that their opinions align with mine. So I'm trying to get those. And I've heard nothing bad about Pearl. So I'm super excited. Yeah. And uh, the end of the year, either December or January 1, we'll probably January, we'll do our countdown of the, our, our top 10 of, of each year. Yeah. That would uh, be fun. Yeah. 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 I think we did that last year, did we not? Am I, yeah, we yeah. did. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought that was the case, but then I was like, you know what? I could be having a stroke and you never know when that's going to happen. Uh, oh, we did. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, uh, life comes at you fast as uh, a Bueller once said. Um, I think that's going to do it this time around. Uh, so thanks everybody for listening. I hope that you got uh, a recommendation for a movie that you might like to see. And if not, that you just enjoyed here in the chat. And if you didn't like either of those things, uh, then you can contact me and I'll get, I'll send you a dollar. Um, also, uh, that what I said just there, uh, not a contract. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Jamie, where can people find more out of you between now and then? Uh, you can find me over at Horror in the House of Salmons. Our second season finale is about to come out. And then we're actually going to be doing uh, heading straight into the Halloween stuff. So for Halloween, we do a theme every year. We've been doing it forever. Um, this year, Brian decided that the theme should be planes, trains, and automobiles. Hmm. So we're going to do 10 movies that take place on a plane 10 movies that take place on a train and 10 movies that take place on various auto or that, or that are involved with, they don't have to actually take place on it. Like, but there has to be, uh, it has to be important to the plot. So that was kind of fun coming up with that list. Yeah. And, uh, that sounds like a and good time. It is. It, it was fun. And actually, whenever he said that, I thought about you um, just because of planes, trains and automobiles. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, love I, know that movie. I know you're a big fan. Um, so yeah. And then how that works in October is uh, one, like every week I, we just put out a, a, our Halloween special for that week. So we've got the season finale coming uh, in the next couple days, and then we'll be doing the Halloween stuff. And then uh, when we come back, I think we're going to take a little bit of a break, focus on some Patreon stuff. And then when we come back, it'll be season three, which is, we have a whole different, theme planned out for season three of the show so uh, we're going to be doing some retooling and um getting a, it'll be a like a fresh thing some of the stuff is saying some of the stuff is changing but it's still going to be a celebration of horror because that's what we do excellent uh all right well and if you're listening to this uh listen to more dark parade there's a, a new episode every ding dong week um you can also check me out over on pick six movies uh, where we just wrapped up uh, the last season, which was called Crichton the Middle with You, uh, <laughs> which was all Michael Crichton movies. And uh, we are starting a new season entitled Deja Vu, uh, <laughs> which is all about uh, remakes of classic horror films. So would you believe it? We're starting with the Amityville Horror. Ugh. Yeah. Um, well, uh, at least I know a lot of people like it. But for me personally, that isn't you. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the, hence the title. Um, and uh, and then, of course, there's Duncan and Come Correct, where Duncan and I uh, currently are making our way through the entire Pink Panther series of films. And we have we just did Return of the Pink Panther, and I think Revenge of the Pink Panther is the next one, something like that. So who knows? It's all Duncan's idea, and it's a, it's a bunch of nonsense. Um so yeah, check out all of that stuff and, uh, and we'll see you in a month to do another what you watch. And so that's it for me. Say good night, Jamie. Good night, Jamie. Ah. <laughs> I don't know what that noise was. <laughs>